plant-based eating. Um, you know, um, lots of things have changed in that direction. I, I hear people say, I have my meat and potatoes. I couldn't do that. I want to be on a keto diet. But um, Zoya, uh, Dr. Ganguly, and Stuart are really going to share some, some thoughts about um, what, what it, you know, what is it to be a, a plant eater? Uh, people are get concerned that you know I'm not going to have protein or iron. I'm going to have bone fractures. I'll, I'll never survive. But the reality is, plant-based eating has three benefits. It's good for your health. It's good for the planet. It's good for the animals. And uh, a number of years ago, uh, I became predominantly a plant eater. I'm not a vet. I'm not a true vegetarian. I still eat fish. Um, I still have some dairy. I still have some eggs. But I'm moving in that direction, so I'm really excited uh, that uh, Zoya and the team has put together a really nice presentation. So Zoya, why don't you take it from here, and thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Kearney. So hi, everyone. My name is Zoya, and I'm a student at the clinic. Um, I myself have been trying to be a plant-based eater, so this topic was really exciting for me, and I hope you all enjoy the information we have for you today. If anybody wants to have dinner, I'm, I'm having a nice big salad, and my number one beverage is water today. Um, and the maple leaves are doing well too as well, so what more can you ask for? <laughs> okay, so we'll just get into our agenda then. So this is a brief agenda of what we're going to cover today in today's webinar. We have a check-in at the beginning, so I'll just kind of gauge how everyone is doing with their health goals. We will talk about what is plant-based eating, how to get started, and then look at the health benefits and the environmental benefits as well. Okay, so this is my little progress check-in here. Feel free to grab a pen and paper and write down your answers to these as well. It's really important to be able to track your progress. And if you want, you can also write it in our chat. Um, so what is your health goal for this month? Uh, what have you been doing well so far to achieve that goal? What do you want to improve? And what changes do you want to make in the next 30 days? Being as specific as possible as you can with these health goals is key. Um, and not being afraid to try new things as well. Okay, so we have an exciting guest speaker here today, Dr. Ganguly, a plant-based advocate and a gastroenterologist as well. So he is going to give a small presentation about plant-based eating before we get into our other information. It's interesting. I met Dr. Ganguly uh, initially in the clinic to uh, look at his lipids, and uh, he was one of those guys that uh, didn't want, want to be on as few medications as, as, as possible, and... Uh, you showed us some uh, really some remarkable progress. So thank you for uh, um, coming on. And uh, he has a wonderful website he can tell you about, a wonderful program, and uh, a great colleague. So thank you for coming out tonight. My pleasure, Greg. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was lovely to get to meet you as well. And uh, it's lovely to meet someone who had similar interests and was interested in health. Uh, so, yeah, if we could flip to my first slide. Um, uh, perfect. Okay, so let's go just back one slide then. Okay, perfect. Okay, click back to my the, just the introduction then. Um, so let me tell you what kind of got me to where I where, where I was at the starting point. So about seven years ago, I found I was very very tired. I was just running out of energy. Didn't seem to have the usual zip, get up and go. So I went and harassed my uh, excellent family doctor. Asked them to do a whole bunch of different blood work. Try and figure out why I just didn't seem to have the same energy and zip that I used to have. And among all of the blood tests is what comes up on the next screen. Next slide. So here is, is uh, the, the kind of basic data that came back from at least some of the tests with my family doctor. So uh, my weight at that time was 161 uh, pounds. I'm only about five feet, five and a half inches. Uh, you never forget the half inch, of course. Um, so my BMI would have probably been about 27 back then. Uh, and A1C, it's a blood test that basically averages your blood sugar over the previous six to eight weeks, which is actually very interesting. You know, most blood tests are, are at a specific point in time, but just because of the way that the glycosylated hemoglobin works is it basically averages your, your blood sugar for the previous eight weeks or so. So normal is 6% or less. If it's 6.5% or above, you're considered diabetic. And mine came back in the middle, 6.3%. So that's called... Uh, pre-diabetes and um, so uh, th that that meant that I was pre-diabetic and I've also put the left-hand column under normal that just means what the normal values are 
and then the right hand column with the title September 2011. That's my blood work at that time. So my up other lipids were, except for my HDL, I guess being a little bit low, my other lipids looked basically fine. The bottom thing, the C-reactive protein, that's a marker of inflammation that I think most people consider among other things to be a reasonable a uh, generic uh, marker of cardiac risk because inflammation and blood clots can go together. And that was uh, actually normal. So uh, with me being uh, pre-diabetic, I must admit that that got me uh, very nervous. Um, and just to kind of give you some context of where I was at, next slide. Uh, this next slide basically shows you what my diet and my lifestyle was at that point. So I would have bran flakes, granola and milk for breakfast. I would have a, a sandwich with whole wheat bread and often some sort of ham or something and some veggies with a Diet Coke for lunch. And then suppers would be homemade. It would be things like spaghetti bolognese, salad, maybe a chicken curry, maybe some rice dal as a curried lentil. So it would certainly fit me within the Canada Food Guide. I think most people would consider that fairly healthy. And my level of exercise was, was um, fairly minimal uh, at that time. So it, it was almost comical in the sense that I'd been a doctor by that time for, oh, whatever, about 20-some years. And it just, it just suddenly hit me when I found out that I was pre-diabetic. I suddenly realized that although I was actually very comfortable giving prescriptions and medications to patients, I didn't really want to take medications myself. I far would prefer to prevent myself becoming diabetic and not take medications. So my approach to that was to start giving talks on preventing diabetes because I find that's one of the best ways to learn is by trying to teach someone. So I, I gave talks on preventing diabetes. I came across a randomized control trial, which is generally felt to be the best way to, to show that an intervention works in medicine. You can, you can look at multiple randomized control trials and something called a meta-analysis, that's even higher. But anyway, I found a big randomized control trial of 3,200 people who were pre-diabetic like me. Yeah, and they were basically- Hold on for a second here. This is, this diet is pretty darn good. Um, well, it's a, yeah. it's a it's a good, you know, like you're, you know, the diet coke and uh, was it in the um, bran flakes are good. You're not eating too much. Body mass index of twenty seven. Um, that's you know, it's that's um better than the, most people I see. Um, how old were you at the time? Uh, about forty eight, I would guess. Yeah, forty eight. Yeah. And, and, and is, is, was there diabetes in your family? Well, that was the other thing that I learned because my dad had to develop type 2 diabetes and I basically kind of learned that it's a bit of a kind of Indian curse. Indians seem to have a, a bit of a tendency towards being type 2 diabetic. I mean, historically, it probably had some survival value in the sense that if a period of starvation came, people with that gene were less likely to starve to death. But I learned that having a relative with type 2 diabetes was a pretty strong risk factor for getting it yourself. So this is kind of what gave an extra oomph to my desperation to try and prevent myself getting it. Anyway, so I found this study of 3,200 people who are pre-diabetic and they were randomized to basically do what your doctor tells you versus a very intensive lifestyle intervention, basically to get them towards a heart healthy diet. So that was a low fat diet. They were allowed to have meat and dairy and this and that, but basically it was what it actually was a, a, I think it was the National Cholesterol Education Program diet, and then they were also told to exercise two and a half hours a week. They had multiple small groups. They basically were coached to do this. So in this clinical trial, this intervention was a very intense intervention because they had weekly meetings initially, and then a couple of meetings a month. This will never be reproduced in real life. And surprise, surprise, four years later, for every seven people who did this lifestyle intervention, they were able to prevent one case of diabetes, so that sounded good. But interestingly, they followed these people for 15 years. And 15 years later, in the lifestyle group, well, in the placebo group who just did what their doctor told them, 15 years later, 60% of them got diabetes, type 2 diabetes. In the lifestyle group that had this intensive intervention, 52% of them still got diabetes. Now that was a significant difference, 52% versus 60%, that was an 8% reduction. But for me, as someone with skin in the game, when I looked at it, I saw that as saying there was a 52% chance that I would have diabetes in 15 years. I considered that a 52% failure rate. So I was a little discouraged at that point, but I kept reading. And so that was when things started getting quite interesting because after that, I came across a different study. So this study actually looked at 99 people who already did have diabetes. 
and they were randomized either to go on the American Diabetes Association diet, which I would have thought was the right diet for them, or on a diet that was called whole food plant-based, which was a bit new to me. Now, the other thing about this study, it had 99 people, which was a reasonable size, not huge, but reasonable, and they followed them for 74 weeks. So 74 weeks is a year and a half. That is a good length of time. And they used this HbA1c, which kind of averaged the blood sugar for the last six to eight weeks. Next slide. So I'm going to show you what the results of uh, that study were. So here we go. So on the vertical axis, that's the number for the HbA1c. If you remember, I told you that 6.5% was the diagnosis of diabetes. So you can see that both groups, both lines start at roughly 8%. Then you can see that the horizontal axis is the time in weeks, 11 weeks, 22 weeks, all the way out to 74 weeks. So what you can see is that the A1C goes down in both groups, but around 11 or 12 weeks, so after about three months, it pretty clearly separates. And what you can see is that the, the black line, the vegan group, which is the plant-based group, is consistently lower from 11 weeks to 22 weeks and it stays lower all the way out to 74 weeks. So here you can see that the plant-based group did significantly better than the American Diabetes Association diet, which A, I found very interesting because it was clearly better. B, I found kind of confusing because I found myself saying, well, if there's a better diet, why doesn't the American Diabetes Association recommend the better diet? And they, so this was actually a, a, a piece of new information for me. Now, I liked meat. I didn't really think I could give up meat, but I kept reading and reading. And so I started coming across more and more studies that use diet and lifestyle. Next slide. So here's a study that I came across that looked at a lifestyle intervention in heart disease. Now, admittedly, well, it was a randomized study, but admittedly it was small. I think it was 46 participants, and they did angiograms. Angiograms is, is generally considered a gold standard way to look at the coronary arteries. And they basically, one group was, just, was told, just do what your doctor tells you. And the other group was told to exercise and go on almost a vegan diet. They were allowed a little bit of skimmed milk, uh, but m mostly vegan diet. They were also told to do meditation, relaxation, and stretching. And they did angiograms. Now, the interesting thing is, is they, they, they looked at these angiograms. That's where you shoot the blood vessels and you see how narrow they are in the heart. And the people who interpreted the angiograms were involved in studies of heart disease. And they basically, that was their job. They would interpret angiograms however narrow they, for, for how narrow they were. And also, the people who interpreted the angiograms were blinded, which means they did not know which group each patient was in. But that's what we call a good study design. So there's, it minimizes the biasing factors. So the vertical axis is how the degree of stenosis or the degree of narrowing of the arteries and the horizontal axis is time, baseline one year and five years. So what you can see is out to five years in the treatment group, that line, it goes down and down. So the proportion of narrowing, the proportion of stenosis goes from roughly 40 percent down to roughly 37 percent. So it decreases by three percent. Whereas the placebo group who are under the care of a specialist and were being looked after, their narrowing increased to about 52% over five years. So that's a big difference. One group became more narrow and the other group became less narrow. In the box on the right-hand side of the slide, I show some of the data between the, that shows the differences between the two groups at five years. One is how much time they were exercising each week. X is the experimental group, CONT is the control group. And one thing, to be honest, I found pretty amazing is the control group was exercising three hours a week, 2.9 hours a week. Obviously, they knew they were in a study, and we know that being in a study changes behavior. But the experimental group was exercising a little more, about 3.6 hours a week. They were doing 50 minutes of stress management a day as against eight in the control group. And fat intake, this is interesting. Most people don't really track that sort of thing, but the average North American fat intake is 30 to 35%. So the control group actually decreased their fat intake quite a bit to 25%. But the experimental group were unbelievable. They dropped their fat intake to about 8.5%. That is mind-blowingly low. And it once again confirms that, well, they were actually on a low oil diet as well. The next line is actually the cholesterol intake per day. Now, for the control group, a cholesterol intake of about 140 milligrams a day, that's pretty low. <laughs> like that's a half an egg a day. Uh, so they were probably watching what they ate already, uh, but the, the intervention group had 
to about 20 milligrams of cholesterol a day. So this basically, the only source of cholesterol is animal products. So that is meat, fish, eggs, dairy. No other animal products have cholesterol. So this is a marker of how much uh, animal products was in their diet. So if they were having 19 milligrams of cholesterol a day, they were almost vegan, which uh, is, is interesting. Uh, interestingly, they were actually having more calories, uh, and then the adherence score just basically measures how much they did their diet and their exercise and stuff. So, so here we can actually see that that in this lifestyle group, uh, they were mostly plant based, and it it did directly affect the narrowing of their arteries. So, once again, I saw this data. So, the net result of all of this is basically that I was dragged kicking and screaming into uh, this plant based diet. So it took me a while. I mean, I, you know, I wish I could say I did it in a weekend, but it actually it took months to make progressive changes. And I kept making changes, kept making changes. Next slide. And so the next slide basically shows what happened to me. Go back. Sorry, go back one slide. Yeah. This is actually an important slide. What I, what I love about this trial is that uh, it's an angiogram. So um, people ask, is heart disease reversible? Well, if you start off with a blocked artery of 40%, if you do all the right things, you can bring it down to about 38%. So heart disease is not a reversible condition. It's a treatable condition. You can actually suck out some of the lipid particles in there. You can actually, you can't change a hard calcified lesion and make that go away. But you can actually make the angiogram better and heal the arteries to some degree. Uh, so the natural it's a natural progression. And Dean Orange just said this really well would correlate to the maximum benefit. It wasn't just a diet. It wasn't the meditation. It was the, the total package, the adherence to the whole program. And as you point out in any of these programs is that people meet weekly. They met, they met in group. Um, and all the, really the successful lifestyle changes uh, that people need to do is that very few of us can do that by ourselves. And with the, you know, like you have a wonderful wife that's very supportive. You have a great environment. But it's, it's so, so to me, it's, it's like being in the NHL team. You practice every day, and, and you need lots of supports to make this happen. So to me, is that um, it's, it's really important to realize is that once you have diabetes, you can put into remission. I don't think you can cure or wipe out diabetes. Once you have heart disease, you don't make it all go away. You can improve on it. And this is remarkable. And I always say is that I sit on the john for five minutes every day, so that's my meditation time. Um, but you can see these people spent a, almost an hour a day of relaxation stress management. So that's actually very important concepts to, to think about. Activity is important as well. The diet's important. The group support, whatever it takes is this whole package because heart disease is fought on many fronts. Um, and uh, so this is actually done without drug therapy. Uh, but the average person that I see in my clinic, uh, we actually did a, a Dean Orange project and we had maybe like five people out of you know 5,000 people that want to try this and to, to, to work in that area here. So you're one of those people that uh, you're one of my heroes. And uh, and uh, and uh, and so for, for you to make those changes to make that stick, what are the things that were most important to you? So you had a personal invested interest, but what, what, you know, what makes you so special? Why are you successful where most people can't do what you're doing or won't do it? Yeah, no, you're right, Greg. I think you're absolutely right. Group support for most people is is absolutely essential. I, I suppose. I suppose one of the benefits of, of of certain groups or certain professions is is you learn to push push yourself. <laughs> and so, as as you know, very well know, most of us are driven people in our line of work. The, I guess to be honest, I think the thing that helped me, ironically enough, is is actually giving talks and teaching. Because I did a, I, because I gave a lot of talks and I did a lot of teaching, I went through this information so many times that basically a little voice inside my head basically eventually said, "Well, you'd have to be an idiot not to do this. You know, you'd have to be an idiot not to make these changes." And even so, to be honest, I think it took a, a took a, it took a couple of years uh, for me to do this. And then the final thing, I suppose is of course I see patients all the time and so I would be telling them them this and then once again when you're telling other people to do something a little voice kind of tends to perch on your shoulder and say well how are you doing in that area so in a sense I was lucky that I was in healthcare I think because my teaching and my talking to others 
helped help me do this. I guess I should say my wife was very supportive as well. I had a very supportive spouse. Interestingly, she never really liked meat either. And presumably she was either used to having me around or wanted to have me around. And so she got used to this information as well. So to be completely honest, I tend to be the one that does the talks and she tends to be the one that chops the vegetables. So I absolutely give uh, credit and kudos to her. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Anyway, so that was that data. So yeah, why don't we go to the next slide to show what kind of happened over the next few years. So this this table, don't get intimidated by it because it basically just shows the same numbers and what happened over time. So my blood pressure on different dates is the first row. The second row is my weight, which as you can see went from about 161 pounds in September 2011 to 145 in November 2012. So in about a year, I lost about 15 pounds. And then it kind of slowly cruised on down to about 140 pounds. So the next line is the A1C. So just remember that's kind of the average blood sugar. That's what I think of it as. And as you can see, it went from 6.3% down to about 5.8% and it's basically sat around 5.7% still. Uh, total cholesterol came down. Uh, triglycerides, uh, which apparently isn't too unusual, went up a whisper, but fortunately they're not as strong a risk factor. HDL went up, which to be honest is perhaps related to exercise. That can be hard to raise uh, with diet, to my understanding anyway. LDL went down, which is nice, because that's a major cardiac risk factor. And then this marker of inflammation, which certainly on a population basis is really quite useful, that actually came right down as well, from 3.2 down to to, uh, to 0 0.6. So like I say, this this gives you a feel of how over the, over the next several years, uh, I was able to kind of um, bring those things down. And I have to admit, I was so happy with the results and I would talk to patients I it, it basically it eventually occurred to me that maybe some of my patients would like to not take medications and maybe some of my patients would would like to address the cause of their disease as against you know um, just taking medications and so I basically started collecting things to help them make the changes and that ended up I learned something called WordPress so then I built a website about that and um, I actually went back to well not quite to school but I went and requalified in a new area of medicine called lifestyle medicine so in November 2019 so a little over a year ago I basically wrote my American exams in lifestyle medicine um, that doesn't actually exist as a specialty in Canada yet but it was actually an incredibly evidence-based experience so that was kind of fun uh, and then I actually started a uh, doing a, a special clinic for people who wanted to adopt this plant-based lifestyle as well to kind of help them. But I guess I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's move to... The <clears throat> so, okay, just show these numbers here. So you can see that, you know, how low should your blood pressure be? You know, you're not taking any blood pressure pills. They're actually naturally low blood pressure of 93 or 67 is fantastic. You lost 20 pounds. Um, you, you still have uh, the tendency towards diabetes. It's something you're going to have to fight for, for the rest of your life. I have the genes for, for diabetes too as well. In fact, you could a CRP of 3.2 is normal. I think a CRP over 2 is, is, is abnormal. Um, it, to me, over 2 is a marker for increased inflammation. And losing weight and exercising can lower your CRP. And you got that down beautifully. We now have drugs to do that to prevent heart disease, but you did it out of a natural perspective. Now, if you had a heart attack tomorrow, I'd be afraid to leave that LDL cholesterol 2.53. Uh, to promote regression on a coronary angiogram, you need the LDL less than 1.0. Because you're a healthy person, you can get away with a, a higher cholesterol. So you're, 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 you've done a great job. Um, there's always always room for improvement, and uh, I, I, love these, I love these numbers. Thanks a lot, Greg. And um, as you say, it's neat that I think you're introducing the principle that there's a continuum of risk here. And that now there are interventions that can keep getting the risk lower and lower, which of course is, is the goal. Excellent. Okay. So let's get back to some of the data. So is, is the, does the data support this? So why don't we go to the next slide? So this is something called a meta-analysis. Each line is a different study and those little squares at the end represent a different study and, and it's probably a little hard for you to see. But the vertical line in the middle, the one that says 0, 0.00 at the bottom, that, that means uh, no effect. And if the box is to the left of that, it means there's a benefit. These are, this is a meta-analysis of vegetarian diets for diabetes control. 
So if the box, if the square box is to the left of the 0, 0.00, that favors the vegetarian diet. The, the horizontal line that goes through each box, those are called error bars. And finally, what they do is they summarize all of the separate studies. So there's one, two, three, four, five studies. They summarize them, and that is that kind of, um, what's it called now? It's not a diamond. The diamond at the bottom, that is the summary score. And because the diamond at the bottom does not over, overlap the vertical line of 0, 0.0, that means that overall it's a significant result. So what this shows is that when you combine the results of multiple studies of a vegetarian diet, the net effect is that they are better for diabetes control. But the final thing in this that is quite interesting is if you look in the second column, it says what the diet was. And the first, one, two, three, four, the first four diets were vegan diets. So vegan means no animal products whatsoever. So basically that means not only no meat, but also no eggs and no dairy. But the bottom study, the one with the red box around it, that was of a vegetarian diet, which allowed milk and eggs. Why is that interesting? Well, when you go back to the, the square boxes on, on, on the right-hand side, you'll see that all of the square boxes are fairly comfortable to, comfortably to the left of the zero line, except for the bottom one. The bottom one basically overlaps, so it strongly implies that while the four vegan diets had a fairly big effect, the, quote, vegetarian one that allowed milk and eggs had a smaller effect, which is either depressing or encouraging, depending on your perspective, how much you like milk and eggs. Yeah, no, whatever. I didn't particularly like this, but you got to follow the data. Anyway, so this basically shows that it wasn't just one study that showed a vegetarian diet is good for diabetes control. Multiple studies... Uh, have actually done that. So then in the next slide, I always want to put things in context. And so in the next slide, I tried to show the effect of drugs versus the effect of lifestyle intervention. So here now, each red dot is the, the vertical scale on the left. That is, is the change in HbA1c with different interventions. The one, two, three, four, five. The first five things are different classes of oral drugs that are used to treat diabetes. Sulfonyl ureas, insulin releases, gluconidase inhibitors, metformin, and thiazilidines are, are all oral drugs. And if my memory's right, Greg, I think you treat diabetes, so you'd probably be pretty familiar with all of these. So you can see that they get an effect of between 1% and 1.5% roughly of dropping the HbA1c. And I haven't had the time because I'm not doing a big lecture here, but there's something called a low glycemic index. You can see that the effect of that is about 0.5% of A1c drop. There's a structured exercise program which looks like it's about 0.6 or 0.7% drop in A1C. And then there's a vegetarian diet, which is the one that I was just showing you, which drops it by 0.4%. So I suppose a fair thing for a person to say is, well, basically, pretty much each of the drugs is better than any of those three lifestyle interventions, which I wouldn't really disagree with you about. However we're allowed to do multiple things, as Dr. Kern, you just said. So Dean Ornish's study looked at diet, meditation, relaxation, and exercise. So if you want to fight diabetes, you're allowed to do a low glycemic index diet, which is vegetarian, and you're allowed to do a structured exercise program. And so you can expect benefits from each of those interventions. So basically, you can more or less add up those three dots. And so when you look at, at the that, you realize that lifestyle together can probably equal pretty much any oral drug. So, you know, that is, is, is really quite a, a, a comforting thing, I think. So now to kind of put things in context and hopefully try and have a practical angle for people, if we can just show the next slide, uh, I'd like to kind of show my, on the left-hand side is what I showed you before, which was my diet when I weighed 160 pounds and I was diagnosed as being pre-diabetic. And then on the right-hand side with the title of now, that's my diet now that I've adopted this whole food plant-based diet, etc. So I went from bran flakes, granola, and milk. Now I have steel-cut oats, chia, two tablespoons of ground flaxseed, and frozen blueberries. Now you can basically get all of that stuff at Costco or basically anywhere. To be completely honest, I've now gone beyond steel-cut oats. I have something called oat groats, which I can only get through Amazon, but steel-cut oats are just fine. And I cook them, we cook them in bulk, so we're not cooking them every day. They do take a, a bit longer to cook. They cook took, take about 20 minutes to cook, so you cook a pot, and you keep it in the fridge for three to four days. And then, so you only have to cook twice a week. Okay, so lunch used to be a whole wheat sandwich with 
some sort of ham, veggies, and a Diet Coke. So now I have a kale salad. Uh, I usually have some sort of beans or lentils and a handful of nuts. Now, I have to admit, I do have, we all have our dark little secrets, so I do struggle a little bit. I do have a bit of a tendency to kind of cave and have a Diet Coke. But now, Costco actually has two different brands of kombucha. So for those who've never heard of it, kombucha is a naturally fermented drink. It's a naturally fizzy living drink. It actually happens to be my favorite drink. So now, I go to Costco, get a case of kombucha bottles, and I have those for lunch, which are absolutely delicious. So supper used to be things like spaghetti bolognese with ground beef and chicken curry, and now I have some sort of veggie stir fries, uh, garlic ginger, rice quinoa. Yeah, there's a, lo uh, a lot of things that you can have. So hopefully that gives you a, uh, uh, an idea of, of then and now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, um so Zoe's going to actually sort of translate to uh, how, how, how that can apply to, to many of us. Now, what I find in many circumstances, people are polarized. You know, I'm just going to be a plant-based here. I'm not going to use medications or I'm, I'm not going to change my diet and just give me pills or, or whatever. So to me, they're complementary. Look, the Toronto Raptors are were a good basketball team because they have superstars and they have bench players. So you got to put your whole team together. And... And what, what I hate to see this polarization sometimes from, from, from people is that that combine the best of every world. And um, so Zoe's going to tell, tell us how to do that and what, yeah. what concerns. I had a couple more slides on the TMAO, Greg. Can I just finish that yeah. up? I think, we'll, we'll, I think we're just going to we'll, – we'll come back to that a little bit later. So I think we just have to move on over here because I want to show people this, um, this, this, this stuff after all. So we'll come back to that, to that a little bit later. So let, let's move on to Zoya's part. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead there, Zoya. Okay, perfect. We have to, food as prevention. Uh, Dr. Gangu has put a, a wonderful uh, website together. I, I love his website. Um, uh, I want you to go back and take a look at that. Take a picture of that, everybody. Next slide, please. Um, and here's some of the foods and um, uh, that, uh, is, 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 is this Dr. Gangu's slides over here? Um, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the end of the road for kind of how far you can go with food as medicine. That's what a final balanced diet ends up looking like with the different portions of beans, legumes, lentils, uh, berries, flaxseed, uh, etc. So so that's basically, like I say, I, I run a separate food as medicine clinic, uh, and this is what we help people to kind of get to if they're willing to give things uh, a trial uh, for six months. And this is, it, it, with, with group support, as you mentioned, Dr. Kernew, this is highly achievable. It's really the easiest way to to do something like that, you know, really. Uh, the easiest way to do And then the next people, slide just shows what you'd ask me to show about the TMAO, if you yeah, want to. We'll, we'll, we'll stop on that one for now. We'll, just, we'll, get, we'll keep okay. going. But we, now, you can decide how much you want to go to, to this extreme, and if you want to do this on a regular basis. These are the, these are the superstars of... Uh, uh, of eating, and um, we're going to explore that a little bit more. And uh, fantastic story! Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, perfect. So, thank you so much, Dr. Ganguly. A lot of what um, he mentioned is what we're going to be covering um, or breaking down in this presentation. Um, so, just briefly, what is plant based eating? It focuses on foods that are primarily from plants. So, this doesn't just include fruits and vegetables, but also nuts, seeds, oils, whole grains, legumes, and beans. And there's multiple variations of these diets. So, uh, we have a semi vegetarian who occasionally consumes meat, poultry, fish, or seafood. A pescatarian, like Dr. Kernew, consumes um, no meat or poultry but fish. And then vegetarian has um, dairy and eggs included, and vegan is no animal products. So no dairy, no meat, um, no eggs. Next slide. So these are some of the major food categories um, that you will see in plant-based eating in addition to nuts and seeds. Uh, we have legumes and whole grains. You can really get creative with a lot of these ingredients in plant-based eating, which is really great um, because there's so much variety. So making um, cooking recipes, there's lots of variation. Um, so we have kidney beans, chickpeas, uh, chickpeas, and other beans, lentils as well. Um, then we have tubers. Those are great. So sweet potatoes, potatoes, yams, um, beets, and turnips. They keep you full for um, long, and they're a great source 
um, of carbohydrates there as well. And then we have fruits and your vegetables. Next slide. So it's really important to find a balance, um, especially since a lot of times if you don't correctly um, engage in a diet, you can be deficient in certain minerals and, um, and not be getting the nutrients you need. So it really is important that you do your research and make sure you're getting a good amount of carbohydrates, protein, calcium, iron, healthy fats, and fiber. So if we go to the next slide, so we're looking at protein here. So a lot of people are hesitant to go to plant-based diets because they're concerned about not getting enough protein, um, which they would normally get it, be getting from meat. But a lot of studies actually show that we are eating excess protein, and that's due to a lot of processed foods. Um, so there are actually a lot of variations of plant-based foods that are rich in protein. So these can include nuts, seeds, legumes, um, chickpeas, tofu, tempeh, there's lots. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I actually broke down kind of the amount and how much protein is in some of these foods. Um, you'll notice I also put the calories there as well, just so that you can keep that in mind when we get into the weight management section. But so a lot of these foods do have a significant source of protein. Um, so there is a lot of variation there and you won't be missing out just because you switch over to plant-based. Um, as well, another micronutrient that a lot of people are worried about that they won't be getting enough is calcium. And so a lot of calcium rich choices for those following a plant-based diet can include dark leafy greens, um, bok choy, kale, broccoli, um, and a lot of calcium fortified foods. And these can include non-dairy milk alternatives like soy milk, almond milk, cashew, and other varieties. And as well, um, we have almonds there, which are a great source of calcium. So on the next slide as well, I've just broken down uh, how much calcium is in each of these food items and how per amount and also how many calories. Um, so just to give you a sense of, of how you can incorporate this into your diet um, with plants. Okay, so then next we have iron. So iron is a mineral that the body needs for growth and development. Your body uses iron to make hemoglobin, which is a protein in red blood cells that carries oxygen from the lungs to all of the parts of the body. So good sources of non-heme iron, so this will be the iron that's found in the plant-based foods. Um, they can come from dark leafy greens, dried legumes like beans and lentils, soybeans, spinach. And the recommended daily dose of iron for those over 50 is approximately 80 milligrams. Um, for those between 19 to 50, for males, it's recommended 8 milligrams. And for females, approximately 18 milligrams. And so these are great sources of iron as well. Next slide. Then we have vitamin K. So vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin, and it helps make various proteins that are needed for blood clotting and also um, to build our bones. So men 19 and older should aim for approximately 120 micrograms, and women 90 micrograms of vitamin K. So we tend to get quite a bit of vitamin K from our diet, um, which is good. And then once again, these are a couple of sources that are rich in uh, vitamin K, with kale and spinach being some of the top foods. Okay, and then we're getting into vitamin B. So vitamin B12, a lot of our vitamin B12 comes from animal products, but there are some plant-based products that contain a fair bit of vitamin B12. The recommended daily dose, I think, is 2.4 milligrams, sorry, micrograms. Um, so these are some of the options for plant-based eaters to get their vitamin B12. Nutritional yeast seems to be quite popular, and it's almost like a cheese alternative in its texture and taste. Um, so a lot of Vegans and vegetarians will find a way to incorporate this into their diets. Um, and then as well, there's some dairy options here as well, which would be the Greek yogurt and the cottage cheese, which contain um, a little bit of vitamin B12. Okay, and then omega-3s. So according to the Heart Foundation, omega-3 fats are a type of polyunsaturated fat that's similar to other dietary polyunsaturated fats, can help reduce your risk of heart disease, so they can decrease the risk of clotting, lower your blood triglycerides, reduce blood pressure, and improve blood vessel function, and also um, delay the buildup of plaque in coronary arteries. So on the next slide, I have some sources of plant-based omega-3 as well. So nuts and seeds tend to be the main source for omega-3. So walnuts, pecans, and hazelnuts, and then chia seeds and flax seeds um, are a really good source of omega-3. So like Dr. Yanguli mentioned in his breakfast, he has um, some chia seeds in his oatmeal. So these are really great foods to just kind of sneak into your meals throughout the day. 
Okay, so with all of this information on vitamins and minerals, you go back one slide, one slide. So one of the things that uh, what you went over all the um, the deficiencies that potentially can be easily corrected on, on plant based eating. For instance, omega threes are, are are basically found predominantly in, 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 in fish, and mm -hmm. um, they're the omega-3s, DHA and EPA are the ones really found in fish, and alpha linear acid is a plant-based form. Now, the plant-based forms get have a weak conversion to uh, the DHA and EPA in a couple of percentile, um, and so there's there's all sorts of issues we talk about. You can see you can be very healthy um, without having to eat fish, um, but there's other benefits too as well as we're going to talk about. Then there's people like supplementation. So. You know, when people start off and saying, is, I, I can't be healthy, so what we hear Dr. Dan Goulin saying is that uh, he put his diabetes, or potential diabetes, into remission. He actually decreased inflammation, a good, good healthy diet. He feels more energized and more energy. Um, you've just shown us very easily that you can get really great nutrition um, from, from plant-based eating. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and thank you for uh, sharing that. And, uh, uh, next slide, please. Go ahead there, Zoya. Really wonderful. Well done. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so now that I've shown you kind of all the different ways to get all of these essential nutrients from plants, um, so how do we get started? So for a lot of us, this can be a very difficult transition. A lot of times um, we've grown up with meat in our culture. Fast food has a lot of um, animal products readily available to us, so making that change when we're constantly surrounded by um, meat can be difficult, but I think it's really great to have a support system and us at the clinic here um, want to be that support system for you. So some of the things you can do is first just eating a lot of vegetables. Um, filling your plate uh, with at least half vegetables at almost every one of your meals is really crucial. Um, it'll keep you full for longer. A lot of people think that they won't be full following a plant-based diet because they don't feel full on salad. Um, but incorporating a lot of fiber into your diet, lettuce and such, there is um, a way to make yourself feel full for longer. So you're actually not eating as many calories, but you are um, consuming all of those great nutrients. As well, try to cook vegetarian meals at least once a week. Um, so trying things like Meatless Monday. I do have a section at the end of this video that has a lot of recipes that you can try out at least once a week. Um, and then share them with us and share them with your friends as well. And then also just thinking, changing the way you think about meat, instead of centering your meals on the protein, think of the protein more as a, as a garnish or as a side and have the vegetables be the main part of the dish. Um, and then so for example, building a meal around a salad. So you can use a lot of varieties of herbs, which you can actually grow in your own home, which we'll show you, um, and a lot of other vegetables to give your salads texture and once again to make you feel full for longer. So before we get into the benefits of plant-based eating, this is something that I just wanted to mention here. What are the risk factors associated with eating red meat? Um, high in cholesterol, saturated fat, lots of salt, which can lead to hypertension, and also TMAO, which Dr. Ganguly was going to mention. Um, but I can just mention something quickly about it. It's formed by gut bacteria, um, and it essentially it's found in red meat and at high saturated fat levels in red meat um, have long been known to contribute to this heart disease. Um, and so a number of growing studies have identified that TMAO has been the culprit for this, and it is complex in terms of how it exactly uh, works, but it has been shown to enhance cholesterol deposits in the artery wall, and studies also suggest that chemicals um, interact with platelets, which are blood cells that are responsible for your normal clotting responses and can actually increase your risk for clot-related events such as heart attacks and strokes. Next slide. So this is kind of where the bulk of our presentation begins. We will be discussing the benefits of plant-based eating. So some of those include better weight management, heart disease and diabetes prevention, having a lighter, lighter environmental footprint, and there's endless creative recipes to try as well. So firstly, getting into weight management. Um, so plant-based eating actually does have a lot of benefits in terms of uh, for people who are trying to lose weight. Um, I put this pyramid diagram in here because one of the most important things in weight loss is having a calorie deficit. Uh, and so plant-based eating gives you a lot of flexibility with how many calories you're able to incorporate in your diet and how full you feel. Um, there are 3,500 calories in a pound. So overall, if you aim to lose a pound a week, you need to be consuming at least 500 calories less or burning those off through exercise. And so getting creative with plant-based meals is definitely a way to shave off those calories throughout the week. So in the next slide, um, I have a diagram here that says, I'm eating healthy, but I'm not losing weight. 
Um, so it is possible in a plant-based diet sometimes, if you're not portioning out your uh, meals correctly, that you can actually gain weight. Um, and so some of the foods that I've listed here on this diagram, such as smoothie bowls or acai bowls, um, for example, if you are eating an entire bowl and there's lots of added sugars, um, you might not notice, but the calories can creep up on you. As well, things like olive oil, if you add a tablespoon of all bread and eating those, um, your calories can come from there as well. And then on the right side, we have fruit juices. A lot of fruit juices tend to contain added sugar. So if you're not juicing yourself um, and you're someone that has a fruit juice with every meal, that might be something you want to consider cutting back. Um, as well with trail mixes, nuts and seeds tend to be very calorically dense. So while they are really healthy for us and we can get a lot of nutrients from them, eating a lot of them in excess can contribute to those calories as well. And then lastly, salad dressings. Um, if you don't make your own salad dressings and you tend to use a lot of cream-based salad dressings like Thousand Island or Caesar dressing, um, calories tend to creep up on you as well there. So just some things to be mindful of. The next slide. So this is just a slide on the Beyond the Meat, um, or Beyond Meat, which is a really popular trend that's happening right now as a plant-based meat. Um, a lot of these meats tend to be very highly processed. So what I have on the slide here is an example of a Tim Hortons breakfast wrap um, with Beyond Meat. And if you look closely at the values at the bottom there, we can see that for sodium, for example, there's around 1,190 milligrams of sodium. Um, so the recommended intake is less than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. And if you're following the DASH diet or trying to cut back to reduce your hypertension, it should be less than 1,500 milligrams. So this is a significant amount and basically contributes to your entire day's worth of sodium. Um, and it's just one wrap. And then another thing to be mindful of as, as well is the calories. So just because you're having a plant-based burger, for example, doesn't mean that you're going to be saving on the calories. For example, A&W's new plant-based burger is approximately, I think, 500 calories. Um, so just being mindful of when you are choosing plant-based fast food options, to be looking at the nutrition label closely as well. So, Zoya, sometimes when, um, you know, uh, McDonald's has their sale to, uh, uh, to, uh, um, um, Two of the sandwiches for for five dollars, or you can get two of the veggie burgers at Harvey's on a whole wheat bun for for six dollars. What, what, what's your thoughts about that as a treat? Is that am I fooling myself? Or um, um, so Harvey's actually has. So we did compare this in um, an earlier webinar, um, looking at fast food vegetarian options, and so Harvey's actually does have a veggie patty, um, and I think it tends to be on the lowest calories. Um, out of all of the fast food restaurants that we looked at. I would, I think it's approximately 300 calories for the whole burger or a little bit less. Um, and so one of the things you can do to have that treat but also be health conscious is to, when you're adding your toppings to the burger, choosing to opt out of things like mayo or any of those heavier sauces, um, and then just doing a little bit of mustard and then filling it up with as many vegetables as you can. I think at Harvey's you can just pile on as many veggies as possible. Um, so go for the lettuce, the tomatoes, the onions, um, and that should keep you full for longer and you're also getting a better deal because it's almost like a mini salad in your burger. Um, and so that should be the lowest calorie fast food option, I think. Yeah, so next slide. Okay, so we're just going to briefly go over the DASH diet as well when we're talking about things like sodium. So the DASH um, diet is an eating plan that requires no special foods but instead provides a daily and weekly uh, nutritional goal. So this diagram kind of breaks down how many servings of each of the major food groups you should be aiming to have per day or per week. Um, so it involves eating a lot of vegetables and fruits and whole grains and staying away from high fat or highly processed products. Um, and limiting foods that are specifically high in saturated fat, such as um, fatty meats, and also avoiding full-fat dairy products. Um, and then also, once again, limiting sugar or anything that has added um, sweeteners in it. And so it's recommended on this diet that you have a maximum of 1,500 milligrams of sodium uh, to reduce hypertension. So on the next slide, one of the things the DASH diet also points out to balance this um, reduction in sodium is to uh, try and eat pota uh, have potassium-rich foods. And so I just put together a brief list here of some of the foods that are rich in potassium. Uh, potatoes and sweet potatoes being at the top of the list. 
And I think a lot of people associate potatoes now as, as a fear food, mostly because the way that it's marketed is in potato chip or in French fry form. But actually, a baked potato on its own is approximately, for a regular potato, around 115 calories. And if you just bake that and you just have one of those for dinner, it can actually keep you full for a really long time. Um, so that's just something to consider, that we shouldn't always you know, associate these things. Of course, if they are fried in a lot of oil or butter, um, they can be unhealthy for you, but potatoes on their own, sweet potatoes and regular potatoes, have been shown to have a lot of nutritional benefits and keep you full for longer. So what, what I tend to do is just take a baked potato, put a few holes in it, put it in the microwave. Um, I make sure I eat the skin, and I don't put anything on it. Um, is that, uh, And, again, I'm trying to replace with salt with potassium, and uh, so you can think of like a one-to-one -one conversion. Uh, uh, potassium has lots of benefits you mentioned previously. And uh, it also uh, lowers your blood pressure. In fact, our weight loss club, we're just starting a, uh, a DASH diet, and uh, we're going to be looking at our potassium content of food right now. So, uh, uh, wonderful. So, um, um, you, you show us a lot of wonderful foods and wonderful modifications. I just remember, like, olive oil is a uh, wonderful food, uh, but the problem is one tablespoon is almost 120 calories. Um, that's a lot of calories. I love peanut butter, but that's, you know, 100 calories again for a, a small tablespoon, and uh, I dare to say that most of us go way above those uh, those, those limits there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so our next section is just going to look at specifically some of the evidence that's out there on the benefits of plant-based eating, um, and specifically how it contributes to heart disease prevention and reduction. Um, so the first thing I want to get into is something called the EPIC Oxford Cohort Study. Um, so the European Perspective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition, that's what EPIC stands for. And the objective of this study was to examine the association of a vegetarian diet with risks of incident ischemic heart disease. Um, so they actually recruited patients or participants for this um, study between 1993 and 1999. And we're still looking at data because they were followed for uh, such a long period of time. We're going to be looking at data in the next couple of slides um, that was published in 2020. Um, but so essentially around 44,000 uh, men and women living in England and Scotland were enrolled in this trial. So if we go to the next slide, um, so they were looking at specifically people who are following um, one of the diets that I had mentioned earlier. So either the flexitarian diet where they had fish, um, so fish eaters, meat eaters who were allowed to have um, meat, uh, poultry, and fish, and then vegetarians and vegans. So what they found in the study was actually that the um, vegetarians and the vegans had a lower mean BMI, so they actually um, were more lean and, and did lose a fair bit of weight. They had a lower non-LDL cholesterol concentration and also a lower systolic blood pressure. And vegetarians had a 32% lower risk of ischemic heart disease than non-vegetarians. So the overall findings from this initial trial showed that consuming a vegetarian diet was associated with lower incidence of ischemic heart disease, um, and then also a lower cholesterol and lower systolic blood pressure. So the next study that we want to look at is the BROAD study, and this was conducted in 2017, um, to investigate the effectiveness of a community-based dietary program. Um, and the primary endpoints for this study were BMI and cholesterol at six months. Um, so this was actually done out of uh, a single practice in New Zealand, and they recruited 65 participants who were um, from the ages of 35 to 70. And these participants were either diagnosed with obesity or being overweight and had at least one type of uh, type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, or uh, hypercholesterolemia. And so the intervention in the study was that uh, participants attended facilitating meetings twice weekly. Um, so that's really what the support, the group support component that Dr. Kearney and Dr. Gang really mentioned earlier. Um, so they were followed for 12 weeks, and they were um, eating a WFPB diet, which is a whole food plant-based diet with vitamin B12 supplementation. So for this study, the conditions were that these participants followed a low-fat plant-based diet, um, so approximately 7 to 15% total energy from fat. And the diet included a lot of whole grains, legumes, vegetables, and fruits and participants were advised to eat until they felt full. Um, so they were also asked to avoid refined oils, 
and animal products, and were discouraged from high-fat plant foods such as nuts, um, avocados, and highly processed foods. And they were also asked to minimize their caffeine intake and sugar and salt. This is actually very interesting. So, to me, um, you know, all of those are good food, but for some calories. Most of these people are, are trying to lose weight. They met twice a week for uh, for twelve weeks, and they met very regularly. So, you know, all these to me, the programs that have been successful at times. It's hard work on on the, the patients' part. So, the individuals were highly motivated to, to make change. Um, uh, they chose basically really healthy foods, and they paid attention to caloric density of foods. Um, and and uh, they, they picked a diet that was most likely to be successful. Um, and uh, what happened? Okay, so on the next slide, at six months, the mean BMI reduction was greater with the whole food plant-based diet compared to people who were just receiving normal care. Um, so they actually did lose weight. Uh, mean cholesterol reduction was also greater with the same diet. It wasn't a very significant difference, but it was um, of note. And also HbA1c reductions favored um, the intervention, um, which was the uh, whole food plant-based diet. Um, so it did have a lot of benefits in multiple different areas. and it, So it led to a significant and sustained BMI and weight reduction. Um, at all points. And so I think what was really important here was the group aspect. Not only were the patients highly motivated and, and eating very healthy, but also having that point of connection with someone else where um, they're able to kind of understand what you might be going through as well as all patients in the trial did have either obesity or diabetes or some chronic condition. Um, and then really building that support group and motivating one another to continue doing this because you want to get healthy. Um, so I think that was one of the things I really took away from the study was that group component. Okay, so on the next slide, um, this is just new evidence that we wanted to mention here as well. So um, as I mentioned a few slides ago, we were discussing the EPIC Oxford study. Um, and so there's been new data that's been published um, suggesting that veganism has some implications on bone health. Um, so there are approximately 65,000 men and women across the UK um, that were recruited between 1993 and 2001. And so they were followed, because this was a, a longitudinal study, they were followed over a certain period of time. Um, and so the diets that these participants were following were either um, meat eaters, fish eaters, vegetarians, or vegans. So um, like I mentioned with those descriptions before, they had um, people from each one of these different categories. So on the next slide, we can kind of see the results of this um, study. So compared with meat eaters, vegetarians and vegans did have a higher risk of total fractures. Um, the potential risk differences was uh, attributed to substantially lower intakes of calcium in vegans and lower intakes of dietary protein in both vegetarians and vegans. Um, so this is one of the things, this is why I mentioned early on in the presentation um, a lot of vegetarian sources of calcium and protein um, because it is important that if you are following a vegan or vegetarian diet that you are actively trying to incorporate um, those into your diet. And then as well, I think the risk of hip fracture um, was higher in fish eaters, vegetarians, and vegans. Um, and vegans had a higher risk of total fractures even after they adjusted for um, socioeconomic status, lifestyle, and BMI. So non-meat eaters, especially vegans, had higher risks of either total or some site-specific fractures, particularly hip fractures. Okay, so now Stuart is just going to briefly get into so, the vital facts. The one slide there is that uh, one of the reasons that they had um, more um, hip fractures uh, is what they, 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 were, um, they were skinnier, and uh, so... Unfortunately, fat protects, so um, so being overweight does actually cause more ankle fractures, but it causes uh, less of the vertebral and hip fractures. So uh, I want to be skinnier and, 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 and fit. So what this, this tells me is that there's lots of diets to pick from, but being a predominantly plant-based eating with uh, you know, whole wheat uh, products and uh, can really make a huge difference in uh, your, your cardiovascular health. So there's lots of diets out there, but this just shows a tremendous result. You show us the, the DASH trial that, uh, that can lower blood pressure. There's a vegetarian diet as well. But uh, uh, this, this diet of uh, you know, predominantly plant-based eating is, is gaining traction, and uh, 
as we talk about, you can do it uh, one day at a time, as you're going to talk about in a, in a few minutes from now. Um, it doesn't mutually exclude, um, um, you know, the traditional medication route, uh, revascularization, and that so many people have actually opted to supplementation. Um, so, uh, plant-based eaters, if you're really a true vegan, then you might need to have some, some, some B12. Uh, other than that, but you can still get that through other sources too as well. So, uh, Stuart's going to tell us about, uh, well, I'll just take some, I don't care about all this stuff. Just give me some fish oils and some omega threes and, uh, and some vitamin D. What happens if we just do that, Stuart? Sure. So the next trial that we're going to be talking about is the VITAL trial. VITAL trial stood for vitamin D and the omega-3 trial. This was a randomized controlled trial, uh, oftentimes considered one of the highest forms of evidence. And what they were trying to investigate, as Dr. Kernu prefaced, was whether supplements would be able to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer in populations that didn't have a prior history of cardiovascular disease. So what they wanted to specifically look at was whether vitamin D or whether omega-3 fatty acid oils would help to reduce cardiovascular risk. Now this was a randomized control trial. I can see Dr. Kurnia grabbing his pills right here, so I'm going to throw it to him afterwards. But this was a randomized control trial of over 25,000 American men and women. Uh, the men were greater than 50 years old and the women were greater than 55. And now how they organized this study was they randomized individuals one-to-one -to -one to two different groups. One was either the vitamin D versus the control group, and the other one was the omega-3 fatty acids versus the placebo or control group. The primary endpoints that they were concerned about was cardiovascular risk, heart attack, cancer, and stroke. And this was a really long study. They followed individuals for over the course of 5.3 years on average. They, um, they did a follow-up every single year, and they reviewed their charts to see if they had any um, significant uh, history throughout those five years. And what they found was that um, for vitamin D supplementation and omega-3... Go back one slide, Stuart. Sure. So the dose of vitamin D is 2,000 units of good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so 2,000 units, it's a good dose of vitamin, vitamin D. Um, and the fish oils were 1,000 milligrams of DHA EPA, the standard fish oil that you can get. Um, Notice that there, if you add EPA, DHA, you don't get fully to 1,000 milligrams because there's all sorts of fillers in, uh, in, in vitamin or omega-3 preparations. And, and they actually used a high grade of this, this to look at this. The reason they took people at the age of 50 years of age, unfortunately, as you get older, risk of cancer, heart disease goes up. And so a clinical trial uh, looks at event points. So, so that's why they, they, they took the age of 50 years of age. So well done, randomized controlled trial. Went on for five years. So... Long duration of, of therapy here. Mm -hmm. And the, the final results that they found was that the vitamin D supplementation and the omega-3 fatty acids did not significantly reduce the risk of cancer or cardiovascular events such as MI, stroke, or cardiovascular related death. Vitamin D, they found, might reduce the risk of cancer related death, but they concluded that further research is needed to determine whether there is an overall benefit to vitamin D. And they found that the omega-3 fatty acids did reduce the risk of cardiovascular events in patients who had a low fish diet. But again, this was some, somewhat of a hypothesis and they required more research. And so as a conclusion, they said that based on the current research, the vitamin D supplementation did not necessarily lower the risk of cancer or cardiovascular events. And in terms of omega-3 fatty acids, Dr. Kearney, did you want to share your information on, uh, on, on your thoughts regarding uh, omega-3 fatty acids? Sure. This is actually one of many trials with uh, omega-3s and, and vitamin D. This is the, uh, first of all, for vitamin D is that taking 2,000 units of vitamin D on a regular basis in 5,000 healthy people did not do really much good. You can torture the data a little bit to try to get something from cancer, but overall, this is a bust. So if, you know, you're, you're going to take vitamin D in the hope of preventing cancer and heart disease, you're wasting your money. Um, the omega-3 story has actually gotten quite complicated. In, in omega-3s, there is something called DHA, EPA, and there's alpha linolenic acid. So um, we had talked about alpha linolenic acid, which is a vegetable form found in things like chia seeds, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but overall, to me, is that it's that cocktail, that combination approach of, of the diet and trying to tease out supplementations doesn't appear to be, to be working right now. So a lot of people are spending billions of dollars on supplements. Uh, 
the, ne- the people that benefit the most are the people supplying you with the vitamins. Uh, they say it's good for the heart, good for the brain. It's good for their pocketbook, bad for yours. So I think this is a terrible investment. In fact, the only um, fish oil preparation that's been shown to be valuable uh, right now is something called Decipa. Uh, it's pure EPA, and we're going to talk about that at a, a, a later date. We have a webinar on this right now. So this is very disappointing. Um, supplements just don't work um, on a large-scale basis, so uh, at least for, for heart disease and cancer. Uh, so uh, we'll look at that more in a more deeper way. So to me, is that you can't replace good old hard work of exercise, enjoying the exercise, enjoying cooking, um, enjoying the get to that get together. Um, but unfortunately, geez, that's too bad. This, it just didn't work. And if you're looking to learn more, stay tuned for a future webinar where we're probably going to be discussing more on vitamins and supplements as well in greater detail. What does work, though, is pure EPA, 4,000 milligrams a day. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a separate discussion right now, at least for cardiovascular health. So it works tremendously well, um, but just can't, can't get it over the counter. The next what we wanted to transition into discussing is the third part of our presentation, the environmental impact of a plant-based diet. So let's talk about our footprint. Livestock is considered to be responsible for about 18% of greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. More specifically, beef and milk products produce 41 and 20% of these emissions respectively. Intensive livestock production is also responsible for a large part of the loss in biodiversity due to plant life use for grass and, um, feed, and to feed crops. And so not only is our uh, carbon footprint having an impact on our own health, um, but it's also having an impact on the uh, other animals who are currently uh, occupying our planet as well. Now, how does organic food consumption contribute to environmental sustainability? Well, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization, Adopting sustainable diets at a global level is urgently needed. Sustainable diets should include a large share of ecologically based, local, and minimally produced products, and limited consumption of animal products and overproduced milk products as well. Environmentally friendly habits include reducing the consumption of these animal products, as mentioned, and increasing the consumption of a plant based diet. Now on the next slide here, we have some data to show you. On the left diagram right here, you'll see that the greenhouse gas emissions from many of the common foods. On the horizontal axis, you'll see many of the common foods. Uh, as you'll see uh, in this section over here, majority of it is meat and produce. You can see that meat and produce contributes the most significantly to total emissions. Um, the light green bar is an indication of how much emissions are released during production and the little teal portion at the top relates to the processing, the transport, and the waste disposable. So as you can see, many plant-based ingredients, lentils, tomatoes, tofu, just to name a few, contributes far less to greenhouse gas emissions in comparison to the, the meat and the poultry of the world. Now, if we look on the other side right here, we'll talk about how much water is required to prepare many of these foods. Again, a very similar trend. A far more greater significance is attributed to beef and um, meat and poultry products compared to plant-based ingredients such as vegetables uh, and fruits. Um, and so not only is it contributing to a significant use of water, um, which is quite costly um, as well, but it's also, as I mentioned, contributing far more significantly to greenhouse gas emissions on our planet. So. Let's talk a little bit about gardening. So gardening is um, a fantastic, fantastic idea and we strongly encourage anyone um, to grow their own garden. It doesn't have to be something that you do outside as you can see here. You can also buy a few jars and create your own uh, little garden inside your house as well. I talked in a previous webinar about how my family is trying to go a little bit more green in terms of the way that we're eating, a little bit more organic. Throughout the summer, we use many organic ingredients, which we buy from Terra and other greenhouses, to be able to balance our diet with many vegetables and herbs that we grow at home. It's a great way to reduce plastic use and save yourself a ton of money, um, not just throughout the summer season, but also throughout the winter as well. And not only are they a great source of nutrients, but they're also a great source of flavor without adding any significant calories. Now, if you wanted to go a step further, 
I wanted to introduce something called the Hamilton Victory Gardens. Hamilton Victory Gardens is a nonprofit organization based in Hamilton, Ontario. This was started in 2011 by two Hamilton individuals who wanted to really make a change. Um, they noticed that there was a lot of empty space in Hamilton that was currently not used and they thought meant much of it could be used towards creating plants and gardens and growing their own herbs and crops which they could donate to food banks and places in the community that were in greater need. If this is something that you are interested in joining and being a part of, we have added the website to the description of our video. You can sign up as a volunteer, you can sign up as a coordinator, you can learn more about how they're making a difference in the local Hamilton community. And it's a great way to give back, um, not only to the environment, but also to the, uh, the people of Hamilton as well. And as we move on to the next slide here, I wanted to transition to about as far away from Earth as you can possibly get right now. Let's talk about the, uh, the recent landing of the Mars rover. Um, for those who don't know, um, on Thursday, the Mars rover named Perseverance landed on the red planet uh, successfully. And the entire objective is to essentially um, uh, look through the planet and see if there's anything, any signs of life, any signs of biodiversity, um, both past and present. Um, I think the naming is, is really cute, Perseverance. Um, because it kind of draws into the next topic that I wanted to discuss. So I thought, you know what, let's pack our bags and let's head to Mars ourselves. So Dr. Kearney and I have had countless discussions in the past about what we feel are essential ingredients or, or things that every person should have. Um, so we wanted to list off a few here. So for those who are joining us right now, these are some of the essential things that we think are great for your health and great um, for the environment as well. So the first thing is space boots. Um, they look a little something like this here on Earth. A pair of good running shoes. Um, getting exercise about 30 minutes a day, three to four times a week. Uh, we've talked about it in many webinars. You can find them in other webinars we've filmed. Fantastic way for your, for your health. Um, fantastic for both your physical and mental health. Uh, whenever you go for a run, or whenever I go for a run at least, I always feel a little bit better and a little bit less stressed out about all the things that have been weighing on me. So. Uh, Getting your exercise has dual purposes. The next thing, of course, why not get yourself a zero gravity bike as well? Be careful out there where the roads are kind of slippery these days, but if you have a clear trail that's paved off, you know, biking isn't just a summer activity. The next thing is your outer space garden. Uh, I've already talked at great lengths about it. Again, you can visit the Hamilton Victory Gardens website if you want to contribute to the community, or if you want to do it on your own, you're more than welcome to um, watch some of our previous videos as well where we've talked about how to create your own garden. I would certainly recommend looking into our video with Chad where he discussed at great lengths about his plant-based diet. And finally, you need your Mars materials for the kitchen. You need a, a good frying pan, some aluminum pots, a good sharp knife to cut up your vegetables. If you were to head to Mars today, you wouldn't need anything more than this. Maybe, maybe one or two shirts, but nothing more than that. And of course, uh, I, I texted Dr. Kearney earlier today and I asked him, if you had one word of advice for the patients today, what would it be? And he shared with me, oh, can't forget a space helmet, that you need a desire to always get better. Don't be afraid to make mistakes if you really want to improve. And that led me to this pun that I've been sitting on all day, which I wanted to share with you. Being healthy isn't rocket science, but like the Mars rover, it takes perseverance. So you can, you can fall down as many times as, uh, as you're going to fall down many times. I've done it personally. I know Dr. Kernu has as well. We've talked about it many times before. But it's not how many times you fall down. It's how many times you get back up and learn from those experiences. So as uh, Dr. Ganguly mentioned at, at the very beginning of our webinar, it wasn't a, uh, a night and day shift from going towards a plant-based diet. But it was something he was committed to. And over the course of several years, he was able to get better at and he's seen the benefit it's had both on his energy level and also on a biological level how it's affecting his heart as well. I'm speechless. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So we'll transition away from Mars and we'll come back down to Earth. Let's talk a little bit about sunlight. Um, these days it's very difficult, uh, I know, to leave the house 
Um, sometimes it's, it's difficult to have the motivation, but I wanted to briefly discuss some of the benefits of just getting 30 minutes of sunlight a day um, and how this can have a benefit on your health both in the short term and the long term. The first benefit, of course, is vitamin D production. We've all heard of that one before. Uh, vitamin D is essential for our bones. Um, very similar to plants, you can almost say it. We photosynthesize. So we need good sunlight as well to be able to have good bone health, especially at a younger age. But recent studies, I looked at one systematic review from 2007, have also suggested that vitamin D production and getting those sunlight, even in your older, in your older years, um, can have a tremendous uh, impact on preventing osteoporosis. It also has a good autoimmune protection to keep you from prevent, prevent you from getting sick. It also helps to release endorphins, which are natural stress relievers. It also helps to release serotonin. Serotonin, it just makes you feel good. It's a hormone that makes you happy. And by releasing more serotonin in the day, it also triggers your melatonin cycles um, earlier in the evening. So that also helps you to get a better sleep. So sunlight throughout the day has been attributed to um, preventing insomnia and helping you get a better quality sleep um, as you age. So exposure to sunlight every day has tremendous health benefits. We recommend that you don't forget your sunscreen, and these days don't forget your mask either. So one thing to remember is that um, you know being outside, it, you know, when it's safe to be outside, it's a great thing. And when the warmer weather comes, is that my best source of vitamin D is going to be 30 minutes of sunlight on my arms and my legs. Um, then I'll put the sunscreen on afterwards. Uh, and I think that's important. So is that uh, there's a whole controversy about you know vitamin D for diseases such as um, COVID nineteen to to falls to um, to cancer and um, to heart disease. But so far is that uh, I think going outside for thirty minutes for a walk with those um, space boots uh, <laughs> on the planet Earth would be a, a good idea when the, when when sun permits and. Uh, Expose your arms and your legs. Uh, get, 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 make your own vitamin D, um, and that's a good thing. You know, some people might need some supplementation, but I think getting outside um, for 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 your health when when uh, when you can do that is wonderful. Whether or not you should take vitamin D in the, in the winter time, we'll come back to talking about vitamin D in more detail mm -hmm. at a later date. But uh, overall, just bl blanket supplementation of vitamin D uh, or blanket supplementation of EPA and, and DHA has been a total bust at this point in time, so, uh, um, but uh, what I'm hearing is that uh, uh, this group together, meditation, relaxation, sunlight, eating, uh, replace what's white with green in, in your diet, uh, tremendous benefit from quality of life um, and um, and to make you make live a little longer. We didn't really talk about this as well, but uh, plant-based eating may decrease cancer by about 30% as well, so lots to think about. Mm -hmm. Very briefly, let's talk about the benefits of reducing food waste. So there are a few benefits, which include, of course, saving money, time, and resources for yourself. You'll be buying less food, reducing methane and carbon dioxide emissions in the world, which tends to come from landfills and your dairy farms. Um, and also, uh, so essentially also it helps to um, conserve energy and resources, which is involved in growing, manufacturing, transporting, and selling products and it helps also helps you of course live better so by eating fresher organic local ingredients instead of going for overproduced meats and uh, overproduced uh, milk products um, we've talked about it at great lengths earlier today that it can have a tremendous benefit on your health as well and finally I wanted to touch briefly on composting so for composting um, we just have a few recommendations for you First, select and store food scraps. So we recommend placing your fruit grinds, your uh, eggshells, your peels, your tea bags, and your coffee grinds into a container and freezing them. Um, for compost locations, choose a place uh, for your compost, whether it's in your backyard, in the garden, somewhere in the community, in a green space, etc. Um, we also, in terms of mixing, mix your greens and your browns. So. Your greens are your food scraps, your browns are your carbon-rich ingredients, such as your egg cartons, the newspapers, dried leaves, and pine needles. And finally, weight and aerate. Uh, you can mix compost mix to fertilize uh, your garden soil. 
so that you can uh, kind of give back to uh, the planet um, and help to uh, grow your future vegetables and fruits. And just a, a, a conversation relating to sh saving your food scraps. Uh, Chad, who is a, a dear friend of ours and who's been involved in a, in a previous video on his food diary where he explained everything he eats in a day or in a week. Um, of course, Chad is a full plant-based eater. Um, he shared how he um, saves his food scraps to make his own broths for soups, which he uses as appetizers to his evening meals. So if that's something that you're interested in and learning about the great health benefits of creating your own broths, be sure to check out this video on our YouTube page, which we filmed a few months back. And we're also going to add the description um, or the link to this video in the description of this webinar. Perfect. So now we're just going to get quickly into some creative recipes. I think a lot of people are scared to go plant-based as well because they're not really sure what options are there for them and think it might be um, extra time they have to take out of their day to make these meals, but I'm just going to show you how easy it actually is. Uh, so one of the first things we have here is soups. Um, so going off of what Chad has mentioned before with food scraps, um, a great thing to do is take them and make your own vegetable broth base. Um, I think Dr. Kearney has been having lots of soups at the clinic as well, just taking some broth and putting some spinach and other vegetables in there. Um, so that keeps you full for a long time and is, is a really great warm meal to have in the winter. Um, and so you can really add anything to your soups. If you make the vegetable base yourself, you can store it in your fridge um, or in your freezer, and then you can just add whatever vegetables you feel like um, for that meal. As well, um, there's a great video that we have on soups and smoothies, and so I really just wanted to touch on smoothies here. Um, but smoothies are a great way to get in those extra nutrients as well. So if you start off with a base like almond milk or soy milk, it does have a fair bit of uh, calcium and protein. Um, and then you can add whatever fruits you'd like to keep you full. Um, and then to that, you can also sneak in your vegetables there. Um, so you can add spinach and kale and blend it up. And if you're, not, if you're someone who doesn't like the taste of them, um, that can really help with um, minimizing the taste. And then you can also add things like chia seeds and flax seeds to your smoothies um, for those extra nutrients. And then top it off with any type of nut butter or Greek yogurt. I would just caution that a lot of times smoothies can be very um, high in calories if you are adding a lot of um, extra or added sweeteners, um, any sugar, anything like that. So just try to use as many organic ingredients as you can. Okay, on the next slide, um, these are just some alternatives I would encourage you to try, especially if you're doing things like Meatless Monday. There's a lot of easy swaps here. So, for example, um, using a spiralizer and spiralizing noodles um, from zucchini, you can do it with carrots and other vegetables as well. Um, and if you're still adjusting and you can't really take the full taste of all of these vegetables at once, you can mix half of the zucchini noodles with half a portion of whole wheat pasta and you'll still be saving some calories there as well. Um, on the next slide, we have Taco Tuesday with half the calories. So I would encourage you, instead of using your traditional taco shell or tortilla, to try using lettuce as almost like a, a bowl or something to hold your um, um, the base of your meal in. So you can do lettuce wraps, you can do lettuce tacos, um, and so these are just some of the ingredients you can add, and it's really up to you. Um, you can mix and match, and the great thing with vegetables is there's so many options that um, every day of the week you can have something different. And then lastly, on the last slide, um, we're not quite in summer yet, but especially during barbecue season and such, um, using lettuce and bell peppers as a substitute for bread is also a great way to save on calories and get your veggies in. Um, so just some food for thought there. And so on the next slides, I have a lot of images from Forks Over Knives. Um, one of the things that they did in the, um, in the broad study is they actually showed the Forks Over Knives movie, um, and it's a really great movie, and they now have um, an entire franchise that basically has a lot of really great vegan recipes. Um, they're really easy to make. I've tried a couple myself, and they don't take a lot of time. And they're also using a lot of budget-friendly ingredients like chickpeas, cauliflower, um, things you can buy in bulk. Uh, so these are just some colorful images of uh, different recipes you can try it at home. And I can, um, I think we've linked Forks Over Knives, the website as well, for you to check out in a later slide. 
And on the next slide as well, I just have a lot of colorful images to show you how creative you can really get with plant-based eating. So one thing about Forks Over Knives, it's a, it's a wonderful video. Um, there's also a new video called The Need to Grow that uh, I'll at one point in time, but uh, Chad and I took a vegetarian plant-based eating course and uh, we had so much fun doing this. Um, um, Chad did all the work, I did all the eating. Um, and uh, I learned so much about uh, how to how to use a sharp knife. And actually, for Christmas, I my wife got me some brand new knife sets, and uh, so I have some sharp knives to make sure I don't cut myself. And I learned how to chop some different things. And uh, so, on your trip to Mars, uh, you need a you need you need, to, you need a good sharp knife um, to uh, chop them vegetables. Yeah, and then just to end off, I know that a lot of times we don't really talk about dessert. Um, but there are ways to get creative with um, plant-based eating and desserts as well. And and these are just some of the desserts I found took really no time. So, for example, just having frozen fruit um, is a great way to incorporate something sweet but low calories and also low sugar. And then if you want to get creative um, and you really want to treat yourself, you can dip them in Greek yogurt or um, some peanut butter and freeze them. And they're a really refreshing snack. Um, as well, something interesting that I found, I didn't really think of that incorporating potatoes into dessert was possible. Um, but sweet potato bites, you can use any type of, um, like a sweet potato or a yam and just mash it up. You can add a little bit of sugar or a little bit of maple syrup, or if you don't want any of the seasoning, if, you're, if you find the taste of sweet potatoes are very sweet, you don't need to. And then you just add a little bit of seasoning and some ground nuts and they form a really nice ball shape. And then um, they're easy to store in a container. You can even freeze them and, and save them for a later time. And then lastly, uh, chia seed pudding. So using almond milk, chia seeds, um, a little bit of maple syrup, and some fresh fruit in there as well. This is another great way to sneak in things like chia seeds or flax seeds or any type of um, uh, seeds that you want. So um, that's the end of our recipe portion. Um, these are just some helpful links and Forks Over Knives is right here at the bottom. So I would definitely encourage everyone to check these out just to learn more about your health and also um, try things on your own. And if you try out any of these recipes at all, we would love if you sent them to us and showed them um, how they worked out for you. Hey, would you look at that? We have a new club at the clinic to join. So we want to ask you, are you doing anything these Sundays? Well, if not, why not join us? We're going to be cooking. Um, every Sunday starting on March 7th at 4 o'clock uh, and we welcome anyone who's interested in joining to to head on over onto our zoom call and, and we'll be cooking together the objective of this meeting is to explore Canada's cuisine and also focus on batch cooking so I believe for our first uh, meeting on March 7th at 4 p.m. we're gonna be doing beans Dr. Kearney is that correct yeah, we're going to be starting off with uh, the beans of uh, Canada. So uh, we're going to start off in uh, a local place. Um, we're trying to eat locally. So basically, if you go 100 feet from my house, we have a, a farmer's field, which is uh, we have about 20 acres to, to, uh, to grow. And we, uh, we grew soybean this year. And uh, so I, I have a few bags of soybean. And, uh, I'm, I learned how to... Um, to basically cook them up and uh, you know how to soak them and how to prepare them and uh, I, I I stick in soybeans and just about everything these days and uh, so we'll do a little bit of that and uh, we also have one of our our, our, our patients is a travel agent and uh, she's done a lot of corporate tours but she's going to come on and uh, we're going to go across Canada and explore the different foods uh, from Atlantic Canada uh, to across the prairies and we're going to explore some Canadian food and little, little Canadian spots because. Right now is that uh, uh, we should tour Canada a little bit more, and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna share some 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 beautiful parts of Canada and some special foods, and uh, more importantly, we're, we're supposed to do batch cooking on the weekend, so we'll we'll do some batch cooking, and uh, we're looking forward to it. It's gonna be a fun hour or so, and uh, and uh, so please, please, if you're interested, uh, there'll be a form there for you to download, and uh, we're gonna just have lots of different people, lots of fun, and uh, lots of chopping, and. Uh, <laughs> We'll try things, and some weeks we'll just do uh, soups, for instance, would be a nice one to do, and uh, well, we'll, we'll have lots of things to talk about and uh, and to share. Um, I, I've learned so much um, from um, all you all you people, and uh, and you guys have helped me in my pathway to get my weight down to around 165 pounds. I'm 
body mass index of under 25 for uh, the first time in, I don't know how many, 30, 40 years. Uh, will I stay that way? I don't know. But uh, I've combined the best of pharmaceuticals, therapy, lifestyle changes, group support, uh, and uh, and uh, we'll show you some other things that we're doing too as well. So uh, thank you for, for showing that, Stuart. And uh, so uh, that was fantastic. I'm looking forward to the chia seeds uh, dessert there. That's uh, what I haven't tried yet. So all viewers are welcome. As you can see on the screen, no experience with cooking is required. Whether you're a professional chef or you've never stepped foot in the kitchen before, you're welcome to join us. And in this slide here, we just want to briefly show you how to sign up. So in the description of this video, we have a form. All you need to do is answer a few simple questions. You just need to give us your name, your email address, and your phone number so we can contact you before our first meeting and let you know of which ingredients you might need. And you just need to ask, answer the simple question, how would you describe your abilities in the kitchen? You, sh you could say, I should be a professional chef, I can hold my own, or what's a kitchen? Uh, and, and then what we'll do is we'll give you a call uh, in preparation for Sunday, March 7th at 4 p.m. Uh, and we'll get you prepared and, and ready to go with all your ingredients before our first meeting. And So, so we'll probably call you a couple hours before that meeting on that, that Sunday. Um, and uh, we'll have some we'll, we'll have some draws for some from some three days to help to you with uh, you taught me Zoya's don't be afraid to um, uh, to try different things and uh, and uh, you've been my personal advisor for I don't know how many years now uh, I guess still we're gonna, we're gonna have to go to Mars and get that get get uh, get there I got my two t-shirts and uh, I got my <laughs> knives and I got I got what seeds we're gonna take there I'm not quite sure yet but we'll we'll figure that out let's see what grows on Mars let's find out how much water is on Mars there so. Uh, I'm waiting for um, Elon Musk and NASA to tell us about that. Yeah, I'm not an astrophysicist, but I did look up what uh, Mars's atmosphere is like and whether it can sustain vegetables on Mars. I don't think it is. Uh, I think Mars is about negative 60 degrees and has a very weak atmosphere. But you know what? Early days in this research world, we're going to figure it out how we're going to do it. Like you said, I think maybe Elon Musk will figure it out at some point. <clears throat> and on the next slide here, we just wanted to briefly show you some of the other focus groups that we have at the clinic. We have a smoking cessation group on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, our great volunteer, Wenny, has been doing this for some time now. She's tremendous. Um, she can give you personal and individualized support if that's something that you need. We also have our new club called the Triple M Club or the Movement, Mindfulness, and Motivation Club. This club meets every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. It's led by those three great volunteers down there, Dia, Hannah, and Jerry. And finally, we have our weight loss club, which meets on Tuesdays at 7 p.m., and that's led by Devanshi. So if this is something that you're interested in, if you want to join one of them, if you want to join all of them, please just send us a simple email to drkernia 232 at gmail.com telling us which club you're interested in, and we'll be able to put you in that club and, and contact you before our first meeting, and, uh, and then we'll get you involved in our, in our great team. And also, uh, Mira's joined um, Devanchi there, and it's really made this club so much, so much better. Um, and uh, and in fact, there's a club there uh, uh, recently as well. So uh, really, really remarkable people in the club and the group. Um, I'm usually trying to climb up some stairs there, the Shadok stairs. I hear the Wentworth stairs a little bit steeper there and a little bit more. So I'm gonna try that soon. And uh, we still have the climbs on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at seven o'clock at nighttime. And for those early risers at six o'clock on six a.m. on Mondays and uh, and Fridays, um, it's, it's it's a lot of fun. So it's just being together, working together, and uh, what what's, what what are some of those other pictures there, Stuart? Yeah, so these are just some of the pictures of the great team that we have here at the clinic. You heard from Zoe and I, but there's so many people behind the scenes that you don't see: patients, family members, staff, friends, all of them alike. So as you can see right here, this is a recent Zoom meeting we had with the Weight Loss Club. Again, those meet on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. And these are just some of the other friendly faces that we have at the club and we like to see around every once in a while. Uh, it just goes to show you that it takes a team, it takes a community uh, to really help you reach your goals. And we wouldn't be able to be sitting here and presenting this information if it wasn't for some of these individuals that you see on the screen. Is that this is a work of so many people. I, I see two fine people in front of me. There, Zoya and uh, Stuart. Uh, you are great examples of people that made uh, all of us better and, and, and healthier. And thank you. And 
there's there's hundreds of people behind the scenes there that make us better each time, and it's just um, we're just getting better. We're still learning. We, we make a few mistakes along the way, and uh, we get up and move. And uh, who knows? Maybe we'll open a satellite clinic on Mars one of these days. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> so for anyone who's interested in learning more. Um, we encourage you to check out our YouTube page. All you have to do is type in Dr. Kernu in the search bar of YouTube and you'll be redirected right to our YouTube page. We have so many videos. Um, if you're new to our page and you want to know, don't know where to start, you can start with this little section that we have here where we listed some of our popular videos, both short, uh, short videos and our live videos. And if you're unfamiliar with how to use technology, we also have a, a whole category of videos for you to watch there as well. Uh, when you click on some of these uh, these mini series, you'll see that there's so many different videos that we've filmed. You can go back to them at any time. You can pause them. You can rewind them, fast forward. They're always going to be there. So if you ever need to check them out or you ever want to learn something new each day, you're more than welcome to, uh, to click on any video that piques your interest. And with that, we just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Um, if you do have any questions or would like to join any of our focus groups, we strongly encourage you to send us an email at drkernu232 at gmail.com. And you can also visit our website at www.drkernu.com. Hope to see you there. Well, again, I want to thank everyone for participating. A special thanks to Dr. Ganguly, who uh, is now is teaching others. Um, and you know the best way to learn is to teach somebody else. Um, um, any final thoughts, Zoe? Right? Anything else you want to park today? Um, no, I would just encourage everyone to go back. We covered a lot of topics, so go back and, and rewatch some parts. Um, and feel free to email us any questions you have um, as well, and then also just send us any of your progress because we uh, love hearing from you. So my journey to be a plant-based eater started off at one of our. Um, breakfast session. We had a pancake breakfast. We went for a walk and it started off with a bet that I couldn't be vegetarian for uh, 30 days. Uh, uh, I, I did pretty well. You know, you know, I'm not sure how long right now. Uh, I was able to uh, uh, to get myself to a healthier weight to be more more fit. And uh, But the number one reason I was a plant-based eater is for the, the, health, the animals. Second is the planet. And third is health. And uh, so uh, that triple combination uh, is great. There's other great diets out there too as well. You can still be very healthy and be uh, a meat eater. Uh, you can still uh, be other forts of diet, but um, that, that, that combination to me was, is important. And uh, So you have to decide for yourself whether or not you want to do meatless Mondays or uh, go to a higher level. Um, I'm trying to decide what to do about fish over time, so um, something that uh, I, I think I'm going to actually migrate away over time, um, but uh, you know, it's like um, it's been a wonderful journey. I've explored so many new tastes and new foods, uh, and I've met so many wonderful people along the way and uh, wonderful experiences. Uh, Stuart, are there any questions or comments from anybody in the uh, uh, out there? Uh, no questions. But if anyone does have any questions, please send them now so we can answer them before we we sign off. But at the moment, there's no questions. Uh, Stuart, why don't you, I'll give you the last word, and uh, I want to thank everybody. Zoya, Stuart, fantastic. Dr. Gangley, it's fantastic. And uh, uh, I just noticed that uh, Joanne and uh, Philip just, just signed off recently. Uh, Philip's another physician uh, who basically had heart disease and um, feels he's putting his heart disease into uh, to regression to, to somebody. He's a, basically a plant-based eater. I see John Deacon was on there recently. He's become a plant-based eater. It seems like a lot of physicians are becoming plant-based eaters. And, uh, so if, if, if the people in the know are doing it, why aren't you considering that a little bit more? But they're also smart too as well. They're not denying the natural things of uh, surgery. So uh, uh, Dr. Deacon had previous bypass surgery. Um, um, and uh, both of them are taking very aggressive cholesterol medications, including PSK9 drugs and conventional medications, and combining the best of the best of modern day medicine and the best of um, of uh, eating uh, and lifestyle changes. So uh, I, I wish everybody a healthier path to getting a little bit healthier and enjoy the journey and uh, keep trying something new. And uh, I want to bid everybody good night and uh, thank you all for uh, for participating, letting us support you in any way we can.